CLP the Master Books and Creations Mysteries present Answers in Genesis. Session number nine, Creationism. Speaker on the topic of creation versus evolution, Ken Ham. But what is the gospel? Because if I ask you that question, you'd say, well, the gospel is the good news about Jesus Christ, his death and his resurrection. He died for our sin on the cross of Calvary. And I'd say to you, I agree. That's the good news about what Jesus did on the cross. But to understand the good news in, Genesis, in, in, the, good news in the New Testament that we read about, for instance, when Paul talks in Corinthians about the good news of Jesus Christ's resurrection, being raised from the dead, where does he go back to so that we understand that good news? He goes back to, have a guess, Genesis. You ever heard that phrase before, back to Genesis? <laughs> you have to go back to Genesis. You see, what he's really telling us there is, if you want to understand the good news about Christ's death and resurrection, then we have to understand the bad news in Genesis. And we've already shared that bad news. Adam rebelled against God. Sin came into the world. Death is a result of sin. That's the foundation of the gospel. The foundation in why Jesus came to be a man, to die on a cross and be raised from the dead. And of course, when Paul talks about the gospel message, he goes back to Genesis to explain why Jesus died on the cross and why he uh, was raised from the dead uh, and therefore we can spend eternity with him. Tremendous message, isn't it? Tremendous message. And I want you to understand this, that as we think about the gospel, that the gospel in reality consists of three basic aspects. First of all, there's the foundational knowledge of creation and sin coming into the world and death as a result. And then there's the power of the gospel, that Jesus Christ was crucified and raised from the dead. And then, of course, there's the hope of the gospel, the consummation of all things. Acts 3.21 talks about a restoration. One day there's going to be a restoration, restored to what it used to be. By, by the way, again, we need to understand, if you're a theistic evolutionist, you really destroy the whole foundations of the teaching of the new heavens and new earth. There's going to be a restoration because, as Paul says in Romans 8, there's something wrong with today's world. It groans and travaileth in pain. There's something dreadfully wrong. That's why we're looking forward to this restoration. And I want to say to you, if you preach a gospel message without the message of creation, sin, and death, you preach it without foundation. If you preach it without the message of Jesus Christ crucified and raised from the dead, you preach it without power. And if you preach it without the consummation of all things, you preach it without hope. And that all of that is the gospel. That's what I call the full gospel. All of that is the gospel. Now, why do I emphasize that? Well, 1 Corinthians 1.23, let me read it to you. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. What does Paul tell us? The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, foolishness to the Gentiles, but a stumbling block to the Jews. The preaching of the cross, foolishness to the Gentiles, foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. Now, I want you to think about that very carefully as we go and consider two particular sermons in Scripture, in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts chapter 17. The preaching of the cross, foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. When we go to Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost, in verse 23, Peter says this, Him being delivered, talking about Jesus Christ, by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. You know, that's pretty bold, isn't it? You nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. You crucified him. And he goes on to say, for instance, in verse 38, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day were added unto them about three. creator yes did they understand what sin was well if anyone stood understood uh, understood what sin was they certainly did they had the law of moses sin was adultery sin was idolatry sin was homosexual behavior sin was murder sin was stealing they knew what sin was all about because they had the, the law did they know why death was in the world yes death was a result of sin what was their stumbling block the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the greeks but a stumbling block to the jews what was their stumbling block that jesus christ was a messiah and I want you to think about this. When Peter was preaching to that group, he didn't really have to lay down this foundation that God is creator, that man is a sinner, that death came because of sin, and to try to define what sin was or anything like that. That foundation was already there, really, in their thinking. It was already there in that society. It's sort of like coming to build a big auditorium like this, and 
the foundation is already there. So to build the structure doesn't take near as long, does it? You know, you ever watch them build a skyscraper? They seem to take a long time on the foundations. Nothing seems to happen for months, and then almost overnight, the structure seems to go up. Because when the foundation's there, it's a much easier job then to build a structure. It takes a lot of work to get the foundation right. Well, I want you to think about this. When Peter went to preach here, we could assume that these people, they certainly weren't evolutionists. What were they? Creationists, right? So he was preaching to creationists. That foundation was already there. So his major message centered around this aspect of the gospel here, the power of the gospel, the message of Christ on the cross and what he did there on the cross of Calvary. And he commanded them to repent and thousands responded. Now I want to go to a different sermon. Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, we have here where Paul went to Mars Hill, beginning at verse 18. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him. And some said, what will this babbler say? Other some, he seemeth to be a setter forth of strange gods because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. Now it's interesting here, when he preached the message of the cross, the message of the resurrection to the Greek philosophers, what happened? What strange doctrine is this? What babbler is this? What bearer of strange tales is this? What nonsense is this? What foolishness is this? What's this all about? Now remember, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. When Peter preached to the Jews, stumbling block. But when Paul went to preach to the Greeks, he to the Greek philosophers, what nonsense is this? Now we need to understand, okay, who is he speaking to? By the way, do you understand what we're saying about presuppositions here? We looked at the presuppositions of the people that Peter was speaking to. Now we're looking at the presuppositions of these Greek philosophers. And you see, it's interesting. The Greeks had no concept in their culture of a God as the Jews would understand, a God separate from, responsible for, but transcendent to his creation. No concept of all of, all, of a God of that uh, in their culture. So what did Paul do when they responded with what foolishness is this when he spoke about the resurrection? He looked around and he saw all their idols. They were very religious people. And in all their religiosity, they realized something was missing. They had an idol to the unknown God. By the way, doesn't that fit with what Paul tells us? That which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath revealed it unto them. They knew that there was something missing. They knew that there was something more. And what did Paul do? He looked around. And by the way, isn't it true too that Paul tells us that the knowledge of God is written on our hearts? We know that there's a God. We know what's right and wrong. We have a conscience. That's all there. So they knew that there was something missing. He looked around and he saw this altar of the unknown God. And he said in verse 23, Whom therefore you ignorantly worship, this unknown God whom you ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. I'm going to tell you who he is. I'm going to tell you who this God is, the real God. Now listen very carefully. What did Paul do to explain to them who the real God was? God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. What did Paul do? He ran a back to Genesis seminar. Isn't that what he did? He said, we need to get back to Genesis. We need to understand who the real God is. He is the creator. He's the sustainer. He made all things. He holds all things together. He's the one that's in control of all things. He's the creator. He gave them a creation seminar. He emphasized that God is creator. That was his emphasis. In fact, as you read through here in Acts chapter 17, you'll find that first of all, he talks about the power of God in creation. He goes on to talk about the goodness of God and his providence. He then speaks against their idols, so he speaks against their wrong religion. He attacks their wrong religion. He tells them they need to repent. He tells them that God is a God who will judge and that they're going to stand before him in judgment. And after he goes through all of this, where does he get back to? He says this, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. Where has he got back to now? The resurrection. And of course, that what Paul, that's what Paul says, doesn't he? He's going to make sure he preaches the resurrection, the resurrection, because if Christ be not raised from the dead, our faith is in vain. That is central to the gospel message. And he gets back to the resurrection. Now, what happened this time? What happened? Did they all say, what babbler is this? What bearer of strange tales is this? This is foolishness again? Ah, no, different reaction. Listen. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked and... Others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. And 
Certain men clave unto him and believe. We've had people come to us and say, we've committed our lives to the Lord. We become Christians. And among them was a man who was the leader of the Supreme Court who later became the leader of the church in Athens. Now it says, certain cleave unto him and believe. Only some, not thousands, as we read in Acts chapter 2 with Peter's preaching. Do you know what I've actually heard? I've actually heard of some seminaries, Bible colleges that have taught their students. I know some pastors that have taught this to their congregations and to missionaries. Look, don't use the methods of Paul that he used in Acts 17. He didn't get many converts. Use the methods of Peter. He got thousands of converts. Get out there and preach the message of the cross. What does Paul say? The preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, but a stumbling block to the Jews. I want to say this to you. Paul was extremely successful because when Paul went to the Greeks, this foundation wasn't there. In fact, there was a wrong foundation there, an evolutionary foundation with those Greek philosophers. What did he have to do? It'd be like coming to build a skyscraper and finding there's the wrong foundation. So before you can start to even build the right foundation, you've got to rip out the wrong one. Then you've got to spend time putting in the right one before you can build a structure. It's much harder work. It's going to take a long time and results are going to be slow at first. By the way, that's really what creation evangelism is all about. That's really what I'm talking about. Paul was extremely successful because he was speaking to people who had totally different presuppositions to him, totally different presuppositions to the Jews, so he had to change their presuppositions from one set to an entirely different set so that they would have a totally different worldview. And by the way, that is a very, very difficult job. Paul was extremely successful, extremely successful. You know, back in the 1950s, when I was a, a, a little boy, the late 1950s, real late 1950s. I was a very little boy. Billy Graham came to Australia. Now this has nothing to do with for him, against him, or, or anything like this. It's just a fact of history. He came to Australia, and he was known then as the Bible says man. I wish we were all known today as the Bible says people. But he's known as the Bible says man. And you know, the whole of Australia was buzzing about Billy Graham. Big crusades, thousands of people flocking forward. In fact, it's been said in Australia's history, it's the closest Australia ever came to revival. I don't know whether that is true or not, but certainly it had an effect on the whole nation. There's no doubt about that. I know a lot of people in Christian leadership today that say they committed their lives to the Lord during those uh, early crusades. And as, again, that's just a fact of history. What's interesting though is when he came back a few years ago, he got nowhere near the response. Australia as a nation was not that interested. Tell you something else, it's interesting. My father was a principal of an elementary school in Australia. We call them primary schools over there. And he used to have Bible readings in all the classes, prayer in all the classes. Before all the students went into school, they would gather together on what we would call the parade ground and have prayer before they went into class. By the way, does it happen today in schools in Australia? Not at all, not to my knowledge. No, not at all. Isn't it true that years ago in America, prayer was allowed in the school, Bible readings in the school? Creation was taught in the school. What happened in the 60s? They threw prayer out. They threw Bible readings out. Isn't it true that years ago the Ten Commandments were taught in our school? They're not now because in America that said, oh, separation of church and state. Can't have the Ten Commandments in our schools even though it is on the Supreme Court building. But there's been a change, hasn't there? You know in Canada, years ago, Gideons could come in and hand out their Bibles in the public schools. Now they're not allowed to hand out Bibles in the public schools. The government won't let them. There's been a change. Something is different. I want to say this to you. Years ago, our society was like the Jews. Creation was taught in the schools. It was taught in the homes. The Ten Commandments were taught in the schools. When you said, you sinner, repent of your sin, they knew what sin was. Sin was adultery. Sin was pornography. Sin was homosexual behavior. Sin was lawlessness. They knew what sin was. Sin was abortion. Because they understood the absolutes of the authority of the Word of God that was prevalent in our society. But people, I think we need to understand something. The church needs to recognize something. I think this is something the church, by and large, has missed. Society is no longer like the Jews. Society has become like what? The Greeks. We have whole generation, an education system devoid of the knowledge of God. They no longer have that foundational knowledge of creation. They no longer understand about the Ten Commandments. We have generation after generation after generation who've been taught evolutionary ideas. No longer do they understand Christian ethics or anything like that. And you go out there today and you preach, you sinner, repent of your sin. And I'm going to say something to you. I don't believe they hear you. I don't believe they understand what you're saying. I think increasingly they don't understand what you're saying. You know why? 
What is sin? Sin's not adultery after all. That's a done thing these days, isn't it? I mean, it's even ripe in the church, isn't it? So sin's not adultery. Sin's not homosexual behaviour. After all, the government of the United States says that's all right, you can do that. Sin's not abortion. After all, the Supreme Court in the United States and courts around the world and other nations have said it's okay, you can abort babies. And, and sin's not even murder anymore. You, you've seen those court cases where, oh, you know what, when he was a little boy, seven years old, someone stole an ice cream off him, you can't blame him for killing that person. You know, that sort of thing that's going on. It seems to me that the, the people who, who should be being put in jail and being convicted of offences are the ones that seem to go free. We see that more and more. It seems as if justice has been turned around. It's injustice now. See, we have a whole different, whole different set of presuppositions out there. You know the sower and the seed, the story of the sower and the seed? Tell me something, when the sower threw out the seed, did he deliberately throw the seed in rocky and thorny ground? No, he wanted the seed to fall in what? Prepared ground, right? You know what Jeremiah 4.3 says? Jeremiah 4.3, we read this. For thus saith the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, break up your fellow ground and sow not among thorns. Sow not among thorns. People, I believe the church today is deliberately throwing out the seed on rocky and thorny ground. They're not considering... They're not considering the presuppositions of the people that are out there. They're not considering the ground. You see, years ago, I believe there was lots of prepared ground, prepared by the schools, prepared by the universities, prepared by the homes, prepared by the churches. But I believe today that that prepared ground has by and large disappeared. It's been cluttered by the rocks of evolutionary geology and the trees of evolutionary biology. And we are throwing the seed out. It is not falling in prepared ground because, you see, the church is making a false assumption. They think the world today is like it was years ago, but there's been a change in presuppositions. There's been a change in the ground. The reason the church doesn't understand that is because the church has helped the rocks and the trees to clear up the ground because they've compromised with evolution. And here we are throwing out the seed, wondering why we're not really being effective in our society anymore as a church. And by the way, you see, look at this picture here. To me, this is a picture of the creation ministry. Here we have the creation bulldozer. We come in, Dr. Gary Parker and, and, and myself and, and the others in the creation ministry, Dr. Dwayne Gish and Dr. Morris and... So it goes on, we come in to remove those trees and to remove those rocks and to plough the ground so that you can throw out a seed so it will be able to grow and so that we can reap a harvest. That's called pioneer evangelism, creation evangelism. You see, I believe evolution is one of the biggest, if not the biggest stumbling block to today's people being receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And by the way, before we go on and someone comes up here to grab me by the shirt and punch me in the nose like they nearly did at one program, this is not an anti-environmental picture. I want you to understand something. The trees are symbolic, the bulldozer is symbolic, the smoke is symbolic, the rocks are symbolic, and there is no owl in the tree. <laughs> By the way, do you realize there is also a Christian philosophy of environmental issues that goes back to Genesis? And when you understand the role that God gave man and the dominion that he had over the world, but nonetheless he was told to watch over the garden, he had to work, look after God's world and so on, you realise Christians should be leading in environmental issues. But what's happened is that the evolutionists have sort of taken environmental uh, issues and they based it on evolution and unfortunately for them the animals and land have dominion over man instead of man having dominion over, over the world. And we get it all the wrong way around. And sadly, many people, of course, have abused God's world. But we need to be leading the way in these environmental issues by getting back to Genesis and providing a right foundation. Maybe that's something one of you out there could do, is to develop that. And I know some people are in trying to get that philosophy uh, back into our nation. Look, see, what I'm really telling you is this. I believe that communication problems lie at the heart of, com of getting the gospel out to our world today. We're not communicating because we don't understand the presuppositional issues, and that's what we need to understand. Let me give you some practical examples. If you went to university and learned a foreign language, do you think you could go out and just speak to some foreign culture somewhere and immediately fit in? Tell you what, if you thought you could do that, you'd be in trouble. Friends of mine in Australia are with Wycliffe Bible translators, and they went to be missionaries in Irian Jaya and uh, Indonesia, just near Papua New Guinea, north of Australia there. And they said, boy, did we get into trouble. They said, we went to our Bible school, we learnt the language, and we did very well at the language. And we went to preach, and they said, we got into all sorts of trouble. We went to this 
a pagan tribe there in the Irian Jaya. And he said, give me some examples. He said, one day I was speaking to them and I held my hand up like that with a finger pointed up like that and I said, there's one way to heaven. And they wanted to know why there were three ways to heaven. He said, no, there's one way to heaven. Why are there three ways to heaven? No, one way to heaven, three ways to heaven. He found out later on that in that culture, he had the words right, but in that culture they point with their fingers down. So even though he thought he said one way to heaven, they heard three ways to heaven. You see, he didn't understand the culture, he didn't understand their presupposition, so he got it wrong. Another example, he was sitting around the fire with them one night and he said to them, the blood of Jesus will wash your soul white and make you clean from sin. They want to know why the blood of Jesus made you dirty. No, 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 the blood of Jesus cleans your soul and makes your soul white and makes you clean. Why does the blood of Jesus make you dirty? No, no, no. And he said, this one took him a long time to figure out, but what he found out was this, a black culture sitting around the fire, they get ash on their skin, they go white, they go dirty. And so they didn't understand what he was saying when he said, you go white, you go clean. You see, he did not communicate. You know, even those of us who speak the same language, like Australians and Americans, now we speak the same language. Well, within reason we speak the same language. I mean, you people have twisted it a bit and changed it around over the years and things like that. And you want to get away from the original, I guess. There are some differences between Australian and American culture, aren't there? A lot of differences. Let me give you uh, one of them. There are a number of American companies that transfer employees backwards and forward to Australia. I've read some of these secular organisations. I've read articles that they've written trying to overcome a major problem. You know what it is? Australians are very different. Australians are very blunt, forthright, tell it like it is. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I don't know how else to be. I really don't. That, uh, you just tell it like it is. You, you know, what you see is what you get. Sorry about that. But that's, <laughs> and what you hear is what we really believe. That's what Australians are like. Blunt, forthright. Americans are a little different. See, here's an interesting clash. When an American says to an Australian, what do you see, think of something? They just tell them. When an Australian says to an American, what do you think of something? The answer is often, I think it's fine. And you know what? Australians think Americans don't tell the truth and Americans think Australians are tactless and blunt and there's an interesting cultural clash there. I've tried to figure out what your word fine means. You go to a restaurant. Waitress comes out, let me show you to your table. How are you all today? Fine, fine, fine. You can be half dead, but you're fine. <laughs> so you all sit down, and then they serve the meal, and she comes back uh, to, to talk to you about it, and you're there saying, this is terrible, this is awful, I'll never come to this restaurant again. The service is horrible, food's cold, I'll never eat at this place again. How is everything served? Fine, 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 fine. <laughs> I found out that fine means anywhere from terrible to fantastic and anywhere in between. <laughs> I had one man come up to me and he said, you've created a problem in our relationship with my wife. Why? Well, he said, I was out with my wife. What do you mean there's a God of love? I don't see a God of love. But you see, you as a Christian are looking at the world through different eyes. You take the Bible as your glasses and you put those glasses on and when you look at the world, you're thinking in terms of creation, the garden, fall, the entrance of sin, death as a judgment, the judgment of the flood, lots of death. The event of the Tower of Babel, the cultures that formed as a result, the giving of the law, the Ten Commandments, the cross of Calvary, resurrection, the new heavens and new earth to come, the restoration to come. Because you look at the world through those eyes, you understand what you mean when you say, can't you see, there's a beautiful world. But that presupposition is no longer there in most of our society, and we're assuming it is, and it isn't. They've got a different set of glasses on. They put on a set of glasses that we could call Charles Darwin's glasses. And they're looking at the world and saying, death and struggle over millions of years. Death and struggle over millions of years. Nature red in tooth and in claw. What do you mean there's a God of love? I don't see a God of love. You see, the problem today is when you go out to preach, you sinner repent of your sins. They don't hear you. I hope your church is not like some churches. You know, witnessing nights are Thursday night, and they go out, knock, knock. Yes, you sinner repent of your sin. Get out of my house. Well, so much for him, he's going to hell. Let me try the next guy, you know. <laughs> knock, knock. You sinner repent of your sin. They all come back together. Great night tonight as they talk over coffee and donuts. Forty people going to hell. Let's go out again next week witnessing. I hope your church is not like that because you see, I found today that most Christians in most churches think there's one method of evangelism. People, there's not one method of evangelism. Certainly, we have that message that has never changed and the message of the cross that is so central to the gospel and we never want to get away from that and that's what we want to preach. But to get people to listen to that, 
the preaching of the cross is foolishness to the Greeks, like it was to the Greek philosophers, then we have to do what Paul did. We have to realize, wait a minute, they've got a different presupposition, they've got a different foundation. I need to go back and give them the right foundation so they'll understand this message. And that's not what the church is doing. You see, that's why I said to you in one of the other sessions, I believe most Sunday school literature today is almost a waste of time. We teach Bible stories, Bible stories. Now, I'm not saying don't teach Bible stories, but what we're trying to do at the moment, and I'm helping to supervise a project, which we're gonna produce a Sunday school curriculum, which does this. We start from creation, the six days. In chronological order, the garden, the fall, the entrance of sin, the entrance of death, the flood, the Tower of Babel, the giving of the law, the cross, the new heavens and new earth. We'll go through a series of lessons with that foundation. Now, what we'll do is, when we're teaching, for instance, about the creation of Adam and Eve, then you will counteract the teaching of the enemy about ape men. You see what we're gonna do? We're gonna counteract the teaching that's prevalent in society that's attacked the foundation. We counteract that teaching, and then you teach the right foundation so that they have a foundation for those Bible stories. And by the way, when you do that timeline, I encourage you, we don't have that curriculum ready yet, but listen, you can use those materials, you can use those videos that we have there, you can do this until such times as it's all done for you, it's easy to do, and put that timeline on your Sunday school walls, on your church walls. Do you realize that everything you preach, pastor, everything you preach, Sunday school teacher, everything you preach goes back to that timeline, somewhere. It goes back, talking about marriage, back to Genesis. When you're talking about death, Back to the origin of death. Back to Genesis. And of course, the message of the cross, it all goes back to Genesis. And when you're talking about the new heavens and new earth, whatever you're preaching, all of our doctrine goes back to that timeline. That's what's missing from our churches. That's what's missing from people out there. You know, when I, when I was a teacher at school, in public school in Australia, some of the ministers came to me and said, listen, we come into this school that you're teaching in and the kids will not listen to us. We talk about Jonah and the whale, we talk about Paul's missionary journeys, the discipline is terrible, they won't listen, it's awful. We're gonna pull out of the school unless you've got some ideas for us. What can we do? They don't listen anymore. I said, do you know what's wrong? In school, they're being taught an evolutionary presupposition and the Christian's presuppositions are being attacked and what you're doing is teaching Bible stories. You know what you need to do? You need to understand where these kids are thinking. You need to understand the presuppositions they've got. You need to come in here and you need to give a foundational course on creation that you can really trust the Bible starting at the beginning and you need to counteract what they're being taught in their other classes so that they'll listen to you. You know, they devised a 12-week, 13-week series of lessons, came in and did that. They came back to me and said, we couldn't believe it. They sat up and listened. They were interested. Lots of questions, fossils, this, that and the other. And then when we went on to the other teaching, we had their attention like we've never had their attention before. Because what they were really doing was giving an apologetic as for why you could trust the Bible to start with, because that's what was being attacked through the education system. And people, most churches today, we have the same message. You sin and repent of your sin, not understanding. People's thinking has changed. The presuppositions have changed. As I said, the church has helped. That's why they don't even uh, recognize it. Have you heard of New Tribes Mission? New Tribes Mission and other mission organizations now do something very different to what many missionary organizations do and, and did do years ago. Do you know what they do? When they go to a pagan culture, they don't start with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Just guess where they start? Genesis. Now, what a silly place to start. At the beginning, everyone knows when you read a book, you start in the middle. Why well, start at the beginning? You know what they found? They found when they went into a culture and preached you sin and repent of your sin and asked for commitments and all the rest of it, they found later on that really the commitments they thought they had, they didn't. They weren't sincere. They didn't understand what they were doing. Those people didn't understand Christianity at all. So you know what they did? They went back to Genesis. Teach about creation. God made everything. Where you came from, your ancestors, Adam and Eve, God made the first two people. Sin, why there's death and struggle in the world. The origin of sin. Go back to the garden there, the fall of man. And, and they talk chronologically through the scripture. So when they get to the message of the cross, guess what? We understand, we understand. I believe every church needs to teach that way too. Because you see, everything in the New Testament is founded in the Old Testament and everything in the Old and New Testament is founded ultimately in what? Genesis 1 to 11 in particular. And what do we tend to do? We tend to ignore that. 
It's foundational. Now, I don't say only teach that. Of course not. You've got to teach the whole counsel of God. I had a lady once who was in church when I was speaking, and she came up to me and she said, you know what, I became a Christian, but for me, Christianity was like being in the middle of a movie. You took me back to the beginning. Now I understand the plot. Just recently, I had a letter from a pastor in Oregon. This is what he said. Dear Mr. Ham, I'd like to tell you what all you have said means to a person who attends our church. She and her daughter are recent immigrants from Moscow. Since coming to our church, she has heard the gospel several times, but it didn't make much sense to her. On September 26th, we showed the film The Genesis Solution. Afterwards, she said, now I understand. All I was ever taught was evolution. Now I understand what you are telling me. She was then given some gospel tracts in Russian that none of us knew what they were. She translated the titles. One was The God of Creation. She and her daughter attended the Back to Genesis seminar. We are praying she trusts Christ on the basis of all she learned. Creation evangelism. I believe every church, every youth group, every Bible study, all adult groups, sometime during the year should have foundational teaching from Genesis. And people, when we know where the enemy is attacking today, we should also be counteracting those attacks. During the year, we should have teaching there. We are almost overemphasizing this because that has what... That's where the battle is at in society today. When you go back in history, you'll notice as you read various commentaries and so on, that some of these great men, they particularly emphasized a particular point in scripture because that's where the enemy was attacking at that time. We need to be like the men of Ishakar and understand the times and understand where the attacks are today and then we need to deal with that instead of being on the enemy's side, as many churches are. A friend of mine was a missionary to the Australian Aborigines and he said, you know, I did what my Bible college taught me to do. I, I preached from Matthew, Mark, Luke and John and I got nowhere for years. He said, one day I went back to Genesis and what a difference. In fact, one Aboriginal missionary after coming to a back to Genesis seminar in Australia, he said, you know, he said, one day an Aboriginal elder came to me and he said, do you know the Aborigine has a story that woman was made while man was asleep? And the missionary said, hmm, open up his Bible to Genesis, read the story of the creation of woman. And the Aborigine said, how come the white man has the same story as the Aborigine and your story is better? And he led that Aboriginal to the Lord. What a difference. Why is it that a lot of the church today doesn't get involved in what we call creation evangelism? Why? I think two reasons. Number one, most of the church in some ways has compromised with evolution and they don't understand the battle. Secondly, there's just too much philosophy in our society that we want a quick fix solution to everything. We live in a society where if you don't get your hamburger within 1.2 minutes, you get your money back. You know, cooking, you don't cook from first principles anymore, you stuff everything in a microwave and zap it. You want it immediately. Isn't that, isn't that what we like? It's one of those societies. And you know, sadly, I think we apply the same in fighting these battles. I want to say this to you. There is no quick fix solution to something that's taken 140 years of intense evolutionary indoctrination. There is no quick fix solution. You see, when you understand the foundational nature, the presuppositional nature of this battle, you start to realize when we're out there attacking the issues all the time, if we don't deal with the, with the ground, in the long run, we're not gonna be successful. The ground is being cluttered more and more by evolutionary thought by the rocks and trees of evolutionary geology. People, we need to reclaim the ground. And you know what, if you're gonna reclaim ground that's been taken over, the plowed ground has disappeared. When President Bush sent the Army and the Navy and the Air Force over to Iraq to reclaim the ground that had been lost in Kuwait, what happened? There was a battle. And you know what you've gotta be prepared for? When you're gonna try and reclaim that ground, there is gonna be a battle. And when you start mentioning creation, evolution, what happens? Man, that's an emotional issue. You know why it's an emotional issue? Humanists realize if people accept creation, humanism, that goes out the window. And we noticed in California when some Christians got voted on the school board. Christians on the school board? What a terrible thing. Fancy Christians on the school board. And before long, these people are trying to take our kids and indoctrinate them in this, and they're going to force them to do this. The emotional battle was enormous. In fact, so much so, they get all the publicity on TV and all the rest of it because they want to make sure we get them off in the next election. You can't have Christians on a school board. You see, people, if you're going to try and reclaim that ground, there's going to be a battle. But I want to say this to you. 
See, there's something else. A lot of people say, hey, the Lord's coming next year, September next year or something. Or, you know, the Lord's going to come back tomorrow. You know, we just need to get out and preach the gospel. You know what? I've got news for you. The Lord mightn't come back for a thousand years. Mightn't be 500 years. Maybe it will be tomorrow. Save me flying back to California and eating airline food. <laughs> oh, that's horrible stuff, isn't it? These days, I just tell them to put it straight in the air sickness bag and save the middleman. <laughs> we don't know when the Lord's coming back. I do know this. We're told to occupy till he comes to preach the gospel. You know, if Dr. Henry Morris had had that philosophy and Dr. John Whitcomb, when they wrote the book, The Genesis Flood, if they'd have said, what's the use of writing this book? To try and counteract evolution? Oh, no, we just need to get out there and tell people about Jesus. If they'd have had that philosophy, where would the creation ministry be today? But you see, they wrote that book. Now there are creation movements all around the world and thousands have been led to the Lord Jesus Christ, changing people's minds and their hearts and attitudes towards God. It's one of the most important missionary organizations today. There is no quick fix solution, but I will say this. If we today, in this generation, started to reclaim the ground and be on the front lines of a battle, and you are, you're in the trenches when you're starting to reclaim that ground, it may be that generations to come will stand up and say, this generation was blessed because they saw and understood and reclaimed the ground. And maybe, just maybe, we don't know where our own history, maybe God will bring, will bring revival to this nation once again if that foundation's there. And that's why I've said to you in other talks, you want to see revival? We need to see reformation in our churches. That's the introduction to creation evangelism. Now I want to give you the lecture. <laughs> That's just the con. I get excited about this. Because you know why? This is powerful. It is powerful. This is where the battle's at. If we use creation evangelism, people, it's going to be slow. It's going to be hard. Results are going to be slow at first. You're not going to see thousands come forward like we, like we did years ago. But you know what? As a result of Paul's ministry to the Greeks, later on churches were built and thousands did come to the Lord. You know, we get the idea today, unless you have mass conversions, you're not being successful. I was so thrilled up in Canada. Three people at that seminar committed their life to the Lord. Normally, we hear about conversions like that after we've been to an area. And I tell you what, we have files of people who've written to us and said, evolution was a stumbling block, came to your seminar. As a result of that, the Lord just grabbed hold of me and I'm a Christian. We've seen that so many times. And what a difference it would make in, in your churches if you teach the children from kindergarten up that they can believe the Bible from Genesis right through and understand the attacks of the enemy. And you know, sadly, there are a lot of Christians that say, oh, you know, all you need to do is believe the Bible. We don't have to worry about anything else. Just believe the Bible. What are your children being taught in school and, and, and many of them being indoctrinated by TV that we shouldn't even let them watch a lot of these terrible programs. But... What are they being taught? All about millions of years and everything else. People, if we don't give reasons for what we believe, they'll say, hey, look what the scientists are saying. Why should I just believe the Bible? To them, Christianity becomes a blind faith. It's not a blind faith. It's an objective faith. That's why we've been giving you these facts to show you, no, not that you can prove the Bible, but God's world agrees with God's word, as Dr. Parker puts so often. Well, what should the priority for creation evangelism be? Do you think we should go to the schools? The public schools, you think the universities? I might shock you when I say this. I don't believe that should be the priority. Now, don't get me wrong. Yes, if we can get to the schools, do it. If we can get to the universities, do it. Yes, definitely. But you know what I think the priority for creation evangelism is? The church. The church. I believe one of the greatest things you could do when you leave here from this seminar is to go back to your own church and be a creation evangelist. Because there are so many pastors, so many elders, so many deacons, so many within our churches that don't know what they believe about Genesis, that aren't sure about dinosaurs, that have compromised with evolution. And we wonder why our young people don't have their foundation. 1 Peter 4.17 says, Judgment begins at the house of God. 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, or heal their land, forgive their sin. God's people have sinned. We have sinned. We need, as a church, to get on our knees before the God of creation and repent of our compromise and repent of not defending God's word, of not giving reasons for what we believe, 
of not teaching our children correctly. Of all the young children, mum and dad, think about it, pastor, Christian leader, think about it. All the people in your care as a teacher, why do you think it says in James 3, 1, be not many masters, for you will bear the stricter condemnation. All the people that we've had in our care, have we taught them their foundation? Have we taught them the truth? Have we counteracted the attacks of the enemy? Have we prepared them for the world out there? Oh, what a responsibility. No wonder it says, be not many teachers for you, or bear the stricter condemnation. What a responsibility to be a teacher. Whether you're a parent, a pastor, a school teacher, or whatever. You know, when I get into churches, what I've tried to do over the years, and I don't have time in this particular lecture to go through all this in detail, I just want to introduce the concept to you. And the details will come in a future uh, program and in a future book. But I've tried to identify the various groups in society, the presuppositions which they have, to deal with their presuppositions, to get them to have the right presuppositions to lead them to the message of the cross. And I want to just give you an idea of, of, of how I sort of do that. When I go into a church for the first time, I assume, on the basis of experience, Many people might believe in creation and the absolutes of Christianity, but they don't understand the connection. They don't understand how the rest of the Bible connects to Genesis. There are many Christians that believe Genesis, but they have never thought through the connection in that way. The, the, what we're emphasizing, marriage back to Genesis, clothing back to Genesis, the foundational nature of it. And of course, then there are those who believe in evolution and compromise. And so what do I do? I think about their inconsistencies in their presuppositions to deal with them. If you've got no connection, to your foundation, there's no reason for your doctrines. You want to put that structure on the next generation, that Christian structure, without a connection to your foundation, ultimately what will happen to the structure? It'll collapse. Two or three generations down the road, it'll collapse. They think science can prove the past, it can't. You see they've got no foundational connection for the next generation. And then those that believe in evolution, not only do they have no connection, but they've got no basis for their doctrines because if Genesis is not true, You've got no basis, so you try to impose this structure on the next generation, it almost collapses in the next generation immediately. And so you need to deal with those presuppositions. My book, The Lie, Evolution, was really written after reading Dr. Henry Morris's book, The Genesis Record, to challenge Christians to get back to Genesis and to get rid of those compromises and to understand that connection. And that book eventually was made into a movie which I feature called The Genesis Solution. And what I would say to you is this, if you want to get people in your churches to see the importance of this issue before you show that 10-part video series that we've been talking about, the Understanding Genesis video series, show the Genesis Solution movie because that really shocks them into getting back to Genesis and the importance of it. Many churches use the Genesis record as, say, the leader's book in Genesis and then for the students and uh, the people in the Bible study or the young people or teenagers use the lie as a textbook. And by the way, that's great for teenagers to give them a basis for their, for their morality. And then, of course, the answers book. I want to show you how to use some of these materials that you've purchased at the seminar. The answers book. Have that ready because for many Christians, they don't have answers to Cain's wife, the origin of races, carbon dating. You need to have those answers. You need to get them ready. And by the way, some people have asked me, I've challenged you in regard to how to train children. And, and I said, is all of that in a book somewhere, how to train children and how, what fathers should do, mothers should do? I do a video called The Genesis Family. I want to write a book about this uh, sometime in the future, but it helps. What, what I've done is try to go through as a father and say, what does the Bible say to me and to my wife about how we're to train our children? And so you might be interested in that. A great little witnessing tool, as we've mentioned to you a number of times, uh, bone of contention. You could use that as a textbook for teenagers too in a youth group and go through that. It gives them great evidence against evolution and, uh, and for creation. And another one that's very suitable for high schoolers, of course, What is Creation Science? Dr. Gary Parker's book. Uh, use that with, with the high schoolers because that deals with most of the arguments that, that they're taught for evolution. Witnessing to non-Christians. Mount St. Helens is a great video to do that with, to knock down the ideas of evolution. And then teaching books. And we hope to come out with a lot more teaching books. But Deers for Dinosaur. By the way, have you ever thought that Christmas presents and birthday pre presents could be books and videos? You think of all the toys that you give children. I don't know about, about your children and grandchildren, but my children, they get given all these toys and they like the boxes they're in rather than the toys that are in there. And then they last three days anyway, and that's it. Give them books this Christmas. Give them videos. Be a creation evangelist to your relations using books and materials. Creation Magazine. Give a gift subscription of Creation Magazine. 
uh, to a friend or to a neighbor. Be a, be a creation evangelist. But let me just run through just a couple of the other groups here very quickly. Mr. and Mrs. Brown. These are another group in society. You ever heard of Mr. and Mrs. Brown? Mr. and Mrs. Brown. You know the good American, go to church once or twice a year in case it's true? You know who I mean? <laughs> Usually Mr. and Mrs. Brown are those that are very moral. You know, they believe marriage is one man for one woman for life and so on. They're really disgusted at homosexual behavior and abortion and things like that. But Mr. and Mrs. Brown believe in evolution. It's fact. After all, it's in National Enquirer. It must be true. <laughs> it's in National Geographic in color. It has to be true. Mr. and Mrs. Brown are interesting. You see, maybe you're Mr. and Mrs. Brown here. Mr. and Mrs. Brown have a Christian ethic, but they don't have a foundation in the Bible, so really they're holding that Christian ethic inconsistently. What do I do with Mr. and Mrs. Brown? You see, Mr. and Mrs. Brown are the ones really worry about their grandchildren. Their grandson came up and said, hey, Pop, I'm going to marry Bill. You can't do that. Why not? It's not right. Why isn't it right? It's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's not right. Why isn't it right? It's wrong. <laughs> their granddaughter came and said, I'm going to have an abortion. You can't do that. Why not? It's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's not right. Why isn't it right? It's wrong. Why is it wrong? It's not right. You see, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, you've got a problem. You hold a Christian ethic, but inconsistently. Actually, you let your children and grandchildren be taught evolution, they're more consistent than you are. Mr. and Mrs. Brown, you need to change your hearts and attitudes towards God's Word. You need to get back to God's Word, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, because that's the only way you can hold these things consistently. And then you'll have a reason for your grandchildren. And by the way, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, I really mean this. The Answers book is phenomenal for them because they're the older generation that went to church but didn't get the answers to Cain's wife and I find that they've got that problem. Cain's wife, that's a problem. That's a stumbling block. Cain's wife. I tell you, I've, I've read so much about Cain's wife. <laughs> and then there's Mr. and Mrs. Brown's children. You know the ones I come across in the public schools. Evolution's fact. Professor says so. All this scientific fact. Relative morality. Do what you want with sex, drugs and so on. By the way, when I get into the public schools, do I stand there in front of a science class and say, you sinner, repent of your sin? Wouldn't work, would it? I give them an apologetic for the existence of God, like I did in one of the other talks. I've often had the principal say to me, please, please don't mention the Bible. The ACLU will take us to court. Please don't mention the Bible. If the children ask a question, you can answer it, but don't mention the Bible. So I don't. I just tell them everything the Bible says. <laughs> I believe there was one man and one woman. I can do that. University of California, Berkeley, scientists said we all go back to one woman. I can use information out of Newsweek magazine, Time magazine. Global flood, hey, the Indians believe in a global flood. Go to the Grand Canyon, one of their legends there, right in the, in the visitor centre. And you know how we've got to protect cultural beliefs these days. So, you know, I, I'm like the Indians, I believe them. There's a global flood. Besides which, when the scientists sent the uh, Viking landers to Mars in the 70s, and then they landed on Mars, you know what the NASA scientists said? We believe there's been a global flood on Mars to explain the canyons on Mars. If they can have a global flood on a planet with no liquid water, I can have one on a planet with heaps of liquid water. <laughs> and sometimes I get the, uh, the students saying, but sir, you really on about the Bible? Glad you asked the question, son. And we go from there. By the way, there's fewer that can even say that. There's fewer that can say that. And they have all sorts of inconsistencies that we also need to deal with. You know, one of the sad consequences of their presuppositions is this. There's no purpose, there's no meaning in life. And so suicide, of course, is a high cause of death. Of course, then there are others, the atheists like Madeleine O'Hare and so on. There's another group, the last group in society. These ones I'm, I'm also really worried about. You know, the people who uh, don't believe in reality. Have you noticed that more and more we have an education system that teaches there's no such thing as truth, basically. Truth is whatever we believe in any one stage and that, uh, you know, you can do whatever you want to do. Uh, have you noticed that? Our education system is sort of producing people who no longer believe in reality. You ever tried to talk to people who don't believe in reality? It is difficult. When we were at Vista, California, there was a group of atheists came along to oppose me. It was interesting. Uh, they interjected during a seminar like this that at the end they came up to talk to me Usually I try to point out their inconsistencies, but this guy actually admitted it to me. He said after arguing for a while about evolution and you know all the rest of it against creation, he said, actually as an atheist, he said, as an atheist we don't believe in God, we have no basis for absolutes. He said, to be honest, we can't even be sure of reality. Really, he said to be consistent, I can't even be sure I'm here. <laughs> I looked at him and I said, well, why are you asking the question? He looked at me and he said, good point. I looked at him and said, what point? He looked at me and said, maybe I should go home. 
I looked at him and said, maybe it's not there. <laughs> he looked at me again and he said, good point. <laughs> I looked at him and said, what point? <laughs> you ever tried to talk to someone from Christian science? You know, when you're sick, you're not sick. When you're dead, you're not dead. Just deal with their presuppositions. Let's go outside. You go through the wall, I'll go through the door. <laughs> they go through the door every time. But you know what's interesting? What our students are being taught in university today is this. Evolution's fact, we just don't know how it happened. Natural selection and mutation doesn't work. They know that mechanistic, materialistic evolution doesn't work. They know evolution has a problem. So who's got the answer? Because really what they need, and they know they need this, they need a mystical element as a God substitute because you see, they know that it takes information to get information. They know that they need information to start, but they need an intelligence. They don't want the God of the Bible. So who's got the answer? Shirley MacLaine's got the answer. <laughs> you see, we're a part of God. The universe is God. We're all God. This is the driving intelligence that makes evolution work. And the new age philosophy, that's what you see coming into schools these days. And I want you to think about this. You see, this nation of America, for instance, and nations like England and Australia, to, to, a, to a lesser extent, particularly Australia to a lesser extent, had this foundation of creation. And the doctrines of Christianity were prevalent. What happened? Along came people like Charles Lyell and others who got people to doubt their foundation. You start to doubt the foundation from Genesis, you start to then remove the structure, the Christian structure from the foundation. And then what happened? Along came Charlie Darwin who replaced it with another foundation, the foundation of evolution. But you see, that won't allow the Christian structure to stand ultimately. So what do the next generation do? They come along and they build a structure consistent with the foundation. And then what happens? The next generation come along and entwine it in some mystical philosophy, some new age philosophy, and they're almost impossible to talk to. But I'm glad that I don't do the convincing. It's the Holy Spirit that does the convincing. I know that I have to do what Paul did, confute, powerfully refute, dispute, use every argument I can, understanding it's God through his Holy Spirit that does the convincing and the convicting and the drawing to himself. Because there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that seeks after God. It's God who does it. But he chooses the foolishness of preaching. I don't know why, but he does. And that's why we need to get out there and do our best. I want to leave you with this thought. It's just a long thought. <laughs> Ever read Romans chapter 10? I'll never forget when I was in a public school in Illinois and after speaking to the science classes, I don't get in very often to public schools these days, after speaking to the science classes, three young girls came up afterwards, one had tears running down her cheeks and she said, Sir, why have I not heard this before? Why have my teachers not told me? Why have I not heard this before? You ever read Romans 10? Verse 14, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of men that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? You know, I often have people who come up to me at seminars like this and say, Oh, we need to get you into the schools. We, you need to get into the local university. You need to get in a local public school. Can you do this? Can you do that? Can you do this? You know what? I can't get into every school in the area and every church in, in America and England and Wales and everywhere. Gary Parker can't do that. Dwayne English can't do that. Henry Morris can't. Everyone comes up and says, can't you do this? Can't you do it? I'm going to say to you, why can't you do it? You live in this area. You go to your local schools. You've got the books out there and the videos. You don't need to be an expert to ask, were you there? <laughs> You've got the materials. You go out there and contact the school. Why do we have to? I can't do it all. I've got a family to look after. You see what I'm saying? I do my best. Gary does his best. The others in the creation ministry do their best to, to be away from their families, the sacrifice involved to come and teach people. But people, the onus is on you. Go out there and witness. Get on the local school boards. You go out there and influence the people. If every one of us started using creation evangelism, what a difference. A man came to me and he said, after your seminar, he said, I worked for Kodak. He said, I, I couldn't witness to people. It wasn't successful. We tried something new. We started showing creation videos, made initial creation around the workplace. 
people flocked along. Now we have a creation video one week, a Bible study the next. We are reaching people we thought were never interested in Christianity. That's why I say get those videos, get those books, be a creation evangelist, start in your church. We found uh, many churches, we've been told when they started showing those videos by about the fourth or fifth one, they had the biggest class in the church. People want the, there's a hunger out there, like I, a hunger like I've never seen before. But how shall they call on him in whom they have not believed and how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard and how shall they hear without a preacher? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Take it out to them. You know, if I can just spend two minutes to, to close here and give you a little testimony. When I was brought up in a Christian home in Australia and we were transferred all around the state of Queensland, most towns we went to only had one or two churches and they were usually liberal pastors. But my mother and father, godly father and mother who trained me from the scriptures, trained me never to compromise. And it was often when the, the preacher would say, oh, a little boy took out his loaves and fishes, and so everybody else did the same. Or the light of the Lord illuminated a red berries in a bush, and Moses thought it was burning. Do you know what my father used to do? In front of us as a family, he would take us up to the pastor, and he would open up the Bible, and he would say, it is written. I think it affected me. <laughs> You know, I praise the Lord for a godly father and a godly mother who trained me never to compromise. When, when I came home and said, Dad, what do I do with evolution? He said, I don't know. I have no information. I don't know, but I do know this. If you don't believe Genesis, you might as well throw the Bible away. I went to the local pastor. He said, you can believe in evolution? No problem. I'm glad I trusted my father. I'm glad I had a father and mother who did not compromise in the word of God. Oh, they got persecuted for it. And they, they got called all sorts of things in the church. You know, they have six children, all committed Christians. And I praise the Lord for a godly father and mother. And you know, when I came across the Genesis flood and the Genesis record and read those, I was so excited. I went and said, look at this, look at this. We're all excited together. And I started telling people, they'd never heard of this. You never heard? So I went out and told them. As a result, you know, a creation ministry started in Australia. It's the second largest in the world. The Lord has enabled me to, to work with a lot of people around the world to bring this message to millions. And I look on it because a godly father did not compromise the word of God. One who stood up for the word of God and one who wanted to see that message spread so far and wide. Oh, fathers, go home and train your children. Train your children. And people, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And let's preach it in a way people will understand. Well, that concludes our presentation. And one more thing, that's to tell you about Creation Magazine. It's the easy way for your whole family to stay up to date on creation and evolution. Creation Magazine is your family's vital defense against all those evolutionary textbooks, nature shows, and magazines that are bound today. 56 pages of full color with no paid ads are sent to your home four times a year. Subscribing helps the message to keep on expanding as you're able to share this exciting material with others. Once again, thanks for joining us. And if you have any questions, contact us direct.